Our final pairing for today's event are titans in their respective industries. And if you take a closer look, they share some similar traits. One is a builder who has built legendary homes, while the other built a legendary career on the basketball court. One antagonizes anyone who stands in the way of sustainable home building, while the other antagonized opponents over the course of his Hall of Fame career. And finally, one is the only person to serve on the boards of USGBC and NHB, while the other crashed the NBA boards on his way to being named one of the 50 greatest NBA players of all time. Here to go one-on-one -on -one in a conversation is Ron Jones and Bill Walton. Hey. I've been, I've been looking forward to this. Now, Bill, I wait. Set your standards higher, please, now, Ron. Now, I know that, Bill, I know that you have some seating challenges, you know, just because well, of your stature. the world is built for preschool well, children. Well, so, so I had some special chairs brought in. Special I had, chairs? Yeah, some special chairs brought in. Uh, and uh, Mike, who's Not the, the little tiny chairs. Yeah, there chairs. we are. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I hate it when I break chairs, <laughs> so I'm not even going to try that. So we'll just throw them in the <laughs> And by the way, Let's folks. just upcycle those. This is, this is Mike Kalignan, the, the voice of God you've been hearing of. <laughs> um, Bill, make yourself comfortable. First of all, I just. From the tailgate to the armchair. There you are, my friend. Okay, here we go. So I, I want to make sure that um, we have our expectations set properly here. And first, I want to thank you all for being here because, well, it's President's Day, and that means that you are all missing out on the best mattress prices of the year. <laughs> uh, and uh, it means a lot to us. I know it means a lot to Bill. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> I'm in Las Vegas. I'm with Green Builder Media. After learning about this incredible group, I have realized that I've wasted the first 66 years of my <laughs> life. But to be in the presence of all you incredible people who do everything to enable us to sustain. And what does sustainability mean? It means the ability to keep <laughs> it going. All I've ever wanted in my life was more. And to be here today at the beautiful hotel and Chow last night and Caesar's Palace and to be with Mark from Solar Edge and John and Eliza from Anderson and all the different people I got to meet last night and to watch the videos and hear all the speakers of this great team. And then to spend the morning with the general, Wesley Clark. Oh my gosh, be sure and read the long gray line, the story of West Point a oh, year after he graduated as the valedictorian. It's been quite a while since I've heard anybody talk in glowing terms of Henry Kissinger and Al Haig. So, <laughs> but to be here today and to celebrate the greatness of what we're trying to do and where we're going, because that's what this is all about and that's what my life is all about. My life has changed so many different times. I'm on, currently I'm on Bill Walton 19.0. And as I wake today, and have a reading assignment for you. Dark Money, Jane Mayer. Ecotopia, Ernest Callenbeck. The Good Rain, Timothy Egan. The Geography of Genius, The Geography of Bliss. Eric Weiner, Wiener, however he wants to say it, it's his name, he can say it that way. And then I have some songs, because you always have to create the atmosphere <laughs> for yourself to be able to, th to thrive. And the songs for today will be We Can Run, But We Can't Hide by the Grateful Dead. And then a whole bunch of Neil Young, Earth. And then we've got from Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan, we've got The Mission in the Rain and The Chimes of Freedom. And so with the, and also from Neil Young, After the Garden. But some of the lyrics from Mission in the Rain and after and the Chimes of Freedom, which will get us going here. All the things I've tried to do, but only did halfway. Some folks would be so happy to have just one dream come true. My dream is far from coming true. My dream is out in front of me. The Chimes of Freedom far between sundown's finish and midnight's broken toll. 
We ducked inside the doorway, thunder crashing, <laughs> tolling for the warrior, tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsake, tolling for the outcast, burning constantly at stake, striking for the gentle, striking for the kind, striking for the guardians and protectors of the mind. And for every uptight, hung up person in this whole wide universe, we gaze upon those chimes of freedom flashing. So after this next, who knows how long it's gonna go. After this, we can only hope that John Fogarty is playing over on the Las Vegas Strip tonight. <laughs> and we can close down this grand celebration of life. Because when I first came across Green Builder Media, and Sarah, and Ron, and Katie, and Mary, and Mark, and the parents of the whole deal, Gary and Sheila, my life was changed, and I do believe that the desert shall bloom. And for any of you who woke up this morning and had a window to the world and to see the snow on the mountains, because whoever commented it was this morning about the importance of water, that's what it's all about. And as we have had record rains in California this year, those of us who live there, we know we get to survive for one more year. So thank you for the mighty Colorado. Thank you for the technology. Thank you for the conservation methods and measures that allow us to reduce consumption to maximize efficiency. Because the challenges that we have are to manufacture, produce energy, and then to manage the resources that we have. And to see the award ceremony last night at the Chow, where everybody got their plaque with a piece of wood on it from the sustainable forest harvesting and everything. And when you read all those different books, and I want you to also throw in a few other just general leadership books of how you build, because this is a building conference leading into the IBS. And those books for the reading inclined are in this order, please. Shoe Dog, Phil Knight. Supermensch by Chef Gordon. Bill Graham Presents by Bill Graham with Robert Greenfield, because Bill died right at the end of the book, but he was putting together himself. He needed somebody to finish it for him. And then David Axelrod's Believer. And as we drift and dream for the next who knows how long, we're going to be getting into a lot of different things. And just want to remind you that as we try to get to the top of the mountain to become the champion, to become the best, to succeed in our journey to the path, that there's a couple of mantras that I have found that have helped me a lot. Number one, it takes talent to get to the top. It takes character to stay there. Never measure yourself by what you have done, but rather by what you could have or should have been able to do. Those who are not willing to risk don't going too far will never know how far they can go. You'll never learn what you don't want to know. And so as I have chased my dream for all these years, after growing up in San Diego, where I still live this very day, here I was being part of some of the greatest basketball teams ever. And that doesn't even count being part of the Grateful Dead. And, but to be a part of the UCLA Bruins, we started there 49 years ago. The records still stand to this day. Portland Trailblazers, I was one of the youngest MVPs in the NBA. And, we were the youngest team to ever win the championship to this very day. This was before they started letting the high school players play. And then, as part of my boyhood dream team, the Boston Celtics with Bill Russell and Red Auerbach. And even though I was part of those great teams, I also spent six years of my life with the Clippers and Donald Sterling. So I know the difference. And the difference always comes down to leadership. But before we get to leadership, a dream without a plan and a deadline is nothing but a prayer. So as I have formulated how I have to get started over so many different times, think and realize and dream what it is that you want. Where do you want to go? And, once you, and, and understand that that plan is going to change every single breath. Secondly, you have to pick a leader. You have to pick somebody who knows what they're doing and can show you the way. And the best leader to pick is somebody who's on their way back from where you want to go. And then you have to join a team, because it's all about the team 
Nobody makes it to the top alone. And then you have to immerse yourself in the positive culture that's been created by the leader, by the coach, by your parent, by the corporate executive. And then you have to build your foundation. And everybody in this room knows about foundation. Because with a faulty foundation, ultimately everything up the line crumbles and fails. And that was my problem. I've got a faulty foundation. Basketball was the easiest part of my life. Academics were second. My challenges, orthopedic health. I was born with bad feet, club feet, if you will. I ground them into dust. Both of my ankles are fused from the knee down. It's all one bone. I can't feel a thing. If I fall over up here, please, Ron, just pop me back up, slap me aside <laughs> the face, and let's get going again. So I got these bad feet, and then when I was 14, Wesley Clark was talking about the epiphonic moment in his life this morning when he was 14 in Arkansas. I was in San Diego. Those are two different places. Believe me, if the pilgrims had landed in San Diego, everything going that way would be wilderness in a big national park. And so <laughs> here I was, 14, chasing the dream, and I was playing against some really old guys down at the gym. They were in their 30s, and I was torching them, and they didn't like the fact that little Billy with his red hair and freckles and big nose and goofy, nerdy-looking face was just killing them. So they took me down with a one-two high-low, and I had to have my first operation. This was on my knee, and it was 1967. It was 52 years ago, the first of ultimately 37 orthopedic surgeries on my entire body here. And then when I was 21, I was high above the basket making a play on the ball, and the guy on the other team, in a despicable act of violence and dirty plays, probably working for a fossil fuel company today. And <laughs> he came from the other side of the court and took my legs out from underneath me. We hadn't lost a game in five years. And I catapulted over the top of him and I landed flat on my back on the innovation of the day, a tartan floor, which is basically only good for landing airplanes on. And I broke two bones in my spine that day. I spent the next 11 days in the hospital and Got up, put a corset on with steel rods in that corset, and flew across our great country, and we lost the 88-game winning streak, January 19th, 1974, not that I remember. There I was. We broke Coach Wooden's greatest and most oft-repeated admonition to us that day. Do your best. That's all I ask. Your best will be good enough. Whatever it is, don't beat yourself. Don't cheat yourself, don't shortchange yourself, because that's the worst kind of defeat you'll ever suffer, and you'll never get over it. We had no idea what the old man was talking about. We were teenagers. We had the greatest lives imaginable, Southern California in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it was the dream come true, but we thought everybody had the same dream. We thought everybody had the same world and life and culture and family and schools and heroes and role models. That turned out not to be the case. In that game, we had a 17-point halftime lead. We had an 11-point lead in the ball with three minutes to go in an era that predated the shot clock and the three-point shot. We missed our last six shots. We turned the ball over four times. I played the whole game. I missed a lot of those shots. I was responsible for everything, basically. And they made their last six shots. And now, Digger Phelps, the devil himself who coached Notre Dame. <laughs> I mean... I understand and I support Wesley Clark, the general running for president, but Digger Phelps, man, that guy belongs at the other end of the spectrum here. And when we talk about the other end of the spectrum, when we come to that sense of the foundation in building our own lives, while my orthopedic health was a very severe challenge to me, my biggest challenge is the fact that I'm a lifelong stutterer and that I could not say a word I could not say hello, I could not say thank you until I was 28 years old. Learning how to speak is my greatest accomplishment and your worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and when Sarah and Ron asked me to come here and speak, I said, fantastic, how long do I get? The longer the better. And they said, Bill, we're gonna keep Ron up here on stage with you <laughs> to make sure you get through this thing. I told them I'd look at the clock and there was supposed to be a clock out here, but they turned it off already. So what could be better for a stutterer? <laughs> But it all leads into, from the goal, the vision, the coach, the team, the culture, the foundation, it all leads into what makes things work. And we know what makes things fail. We see it every single day. Lack of honor, greed, selfishness, it leads to anger and hatred, lies, deceit, 
dishonesty, hypocrisy. The world is growing dark and mean before our eyes. We have to come with the fight because this is not going to be easy. And this is never going to be over. And if you read the books from the very start of that list, you're going to realize the depth, the power, and the resources of the guys on the other side. But just ask yourself this question. And when you make your choices in life, as I make mine, based on people, purpose, passion, programs, and projects, if somebody comes to me and he presents his program and he identifies his team as approximately 40 guys who are currently either in jail, under subpoena, or under indictment for criminal behavior, and this guy has already been chronicled with more than 8,000 lies, and the guy on the other side is Ron and Sarah and Green Builder Media. I know which direction I'm going, standing in the fork in the road, because I know through personal experience that the road to the promised land, the golden road to unlimited devotion in the top of the mountain, that is paved with honor, with sacrifice, and discipline. But don't think for a minute that this is ever going to be easy. If life was going to be easy, we'd just all be here at UNLV all day, every day, in the, in the ham auditorium, listening backstage to John Fogarty and Jerry Garcia and Bob Dylan before coming out here and talking about sustainability. But just think how in the course of our lives, the fights that we've had to commit ourselves. General Clark was right this morning. There is no greater fight. It's unending, though. Think about the fight. Do you, do you believe that the British were just going to leave 240 years ago? No. Do you think that the people that are part of the Confederacy were just going to say, you know what, you're right. You're, you're right, slavery is a bad economic model. We're not going to go that way. We'll just change. No. Do you think that the integration battles, do you think that Brown versus Board of Case, Brown versus Board of Education, that Jackie Robinson, that the Civil Rights, that Vietnam, that Nixon, do you think all these people would have just said, oh, you know, you're right, we're not going to do this anymore. We'll just, we'll be convinced. They're not going to be convinced. And so as we move forward with bringing the fight, we have to realize that it's going to take everything we have. My concept of everything changed dramatically 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, excuse me, 11 years ago on February 24, 2008, my spine failed after all the years of chasing the dream. Bad feet, bad foundation, crooked spine, it just doesn't work. I got off the plane that day, I've been flying 600,000 domestic air miles every year, chasing the dream, trying to make it happen. Got off the plane that day, San Diego, I could no longer move. I spent the next four and a half years on the ground. My life was over. It was not worth living. I was going to kill myself. The pain was excruciating, debilitating, and unrelenting. I can only describe it as being dropped in a vat of scalding acid that had an electrifying current running through it. And I could never get out. I'm saved. I was saved. My life was saved. I had no life. It was not worth living. But I had surgery, spine surgery, on February 8th. 2009, 10 years and 10 days ago. And it's a miracle what's happened to me because I am all better, no pain, no medication. I've never been busier, I've never been happier, and I haven't been healthier since I was 13 years old and those two thugs from the high school down in San Diego took my leg out from underneath me. And so as we get ready for this endless fight against the powers that be, I have a few questions, a few questions that we all have to ask ourselves. And I have a few questions for General Clark, too. And we'll start with, why do we keep doing things that we know are wrong? Why, when we acknowledge and accept that cigarettes are bad for people, that we, through our Chamber of Commerce and our State Department, unload them and dump them on the rest of the world? Why? Are we not making the people who damage the earth pay to heal it? One of the first things that we learn when we're just very cognizant of life in our own existence 
clean up after yourself, be responsible for the mess you make, and then dispose of your waste. And so when we have this battle, and I don't see it's a battle at all, I see it's all rolling into one, because everything's connected, and when we listen to the nonsense of why we can't do something, I know that's inaccurate. Because every time we hear, oh, you can't do that, that'll never work, as soon as we do it, it works. The reason they say that is because of their economic self-interest. And so when other people, these fossil fuel companies, these chemical companies, when they say, no, that'll never work, and the Green New Deal, no one, sustainable energy, and all the different things that we're trying to do to keep it all going, because all I ever wanted in life was more. And here we are, we hear these arguments. You can't do that. It'll never work. It does work. But it really won't work until we change the politicians in Washington on a state by state level, a county by county, city by city level. We've seen what has happened in the last three months just with one election. One of the great failures in our lifetime was we got to the top with Barack Obama. We were there, it was happening, and then everybody just took a deep breath and went and sat down. Read Dark Money. We never have a chance to just take that deep breath again. We have to keep fighting. And when we have this, the policies that we have to initiate just for solar. Solar is the biggest no-brainer in the history of the world. And so you know, the states, Hawaii and California, the other ones who are mandating the 100% renewable energy is fantastic. Every state has to do that. We can't wait until we get those guys out of there in Washington who are standing in our way. And then the permitting. You guys are all in building. You know the permitting process. I'm a big fan of regulations. I'm a big fan of rules. Imagine the sport of basketball without rules. Are you kidding me? That's like playing against Artis Gilmore and Shaquille O'Neal every day. And so, but those rules and regulations make it a fair game and a fair fight. And you have to have that fairness in the level playing field. And so with the new Solar Foundation Solar app, which allows one day permitting just in the rollout stage right now, that's going to be fantastic. And then we have to eliminate all the caps, all the caps on, on, on net metering. But in a bigger problem and in a bigger picture is the fact that that economic versus the environment argument that they always try to throw in our face. How about if we take the subsidies that the fossil fuels and the companies and the chemical companies get, we take those and they take ours. And we'll see how happy they are with the situation. And then how about imposing the true costs, the true costs of what they do to the earth when they clear cut the forest, when they pollute the streams and rivers, when they pollute the atmosphere. Our bodies are microcosms of the earth. We treat our cars better than we treat our bodies until you get sick. Once you get sick, as I was, and it all fails, and your comprehension of everything expands and goes to ever new heights, then you understand and appreciate and embrace all the different things that I've been talking about up here. And so when I was most fortunate to be the broadcaster with Michael Jordan, you know, I, it was such an honor and such a privilege. And if any of you ever had the chance to watch basketball, some of the great ones of the course of the game, Michael will rise up there with all of them, Kareem, the best I ever played against. Did any of you ever sit around before the game and say, gee, do you think that Kareem or Michael are going to have a good game today? No. The challenge as the broadcaster for Michael was to come up with a good broadcast and a good show and make it interesting. And so I come in, it's my turn to, to, broad, you know, to, to ask the questions to Michael. So I walk in, I'm fired up, I'm ready to go, and I say, Michael, Michael, hey, what does it mean to you that you single-handedly have proven that Copernicus, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, and Stephen Hawking have no idea what they're talking about, and physics and gravity don't exist, with apologies to General Wesley Clark, who's also a physicist. Michael looked at me with dazed confusion, as you folks are sounding like that out there right now. I wasn't waiting around. And so I quickly got to my next question, which was, Michael, here you are, average size. 
Not the biggest, not the strongest, not the fastest, can't jump the highest. But here it is every single day, every single game, Michael, you're coming out here. Every opponent you ever play against is the winner of the genetic lottery. Akeem, Ewing, Samson, Robinson, Shaq, Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan. It's an endless list. And here's little old Michael. Can't jump the highest, can't run the fastest, not the strongest, but he's coming out there every single night and he's coming down that lane and he is throwing it down in their face and looking right at their opponent's eyes and saying, there's nothing you can do about what I've got. Now, I work for ESPN and have for quite a few years. And at ESPN and our control board in the Bristol studios, they have a Michael Jordan button. Whenever there's a lull in the world of action sports, they just push the Michael Jordan button and it starts looping these endless plays of his remarkable brilliance. And I said, Michael, how much time do you spend on all of this? These brilliant plays that no one else has ever done before or since. And he looked at me with incredulity and he said, Bill, I don't spend a second on any of that stuff. I spend all my time on my fundamentals, my foundation, my physical fitness and my footwork. But what I really spend my time on, Bill, is the dream. The dream of how I'm going to get to where I want and with who I have as my team around me and what the other team has and figuring out the plan forward. But the plan forward, it's never a final plan. And for those of you who are thinking we're just going to wait, we're going to wait until everything is perfect, until all the technology is in place, until all the infrastructure is in place. That's not the way progress in life works. It works by understanding, accepting, embracing the fact that you can never finish what you don't start. And so as we come back to the leader and the leadership responsibilities and the duties and his plan, I want to talk about one of the great leaders in my lifetime, David Brenner, and his remarkable book, The Wildness Within, not written by him, but written about him, written by his son, Kenneth about this remarkable human being from California and Berkeley and all the fights that he was in. And his failures were because people wouldn't come with him. But this guy, David, was so special and so remarkable. The Wildness Within is the book. And as we talk about the leadership and how we're going to get to where we want to go, because there's never been a great team, program, organization, company, or individual without a great leader. And what are the defining traits of the leadership? Illuminate the path forward. Tell everybody where we're going and how we're going to get there. Never ask anybody to do anything you haven't already done or aren't willing to do yourself. Pull the team together, define the terms of the conflict, make them play your game. Do what others can't and won't do. Lead the relentless offensive attack. Offense wins. Accept, embrace, Learn to love the life of uncertainty, risk, failure, doubt, hesitation, uncertainty, and that on every single encounter you're going to have in life, you might fail. But you'll never finish what you don't start. Then, the fact that the leader has to be able to say no. And when he can say no, and the team still buys in because there's loyalty, then we've got a chance. And finally, when things go wrong, it's not if, they are going to go wrong. When things go wrong, the leader has to accept the responsibility. And it's not somebody else's fault because things have gone wrong when you're the leader. And before we get to Ron, let me just tell you one quick thing about the use of the word no. So when you look like this, you get no your entire life. And so when our children were growing up, Lori and I, we have four children. We were net four boys. We have nine grandchildren and more coming with every phone call. And so <laughs> as the boys were coming of age, today they're 43, 41, 39, and 37. But for the years when they were just coming of age and they were starting to, to fight back, and they would look at me and they would say, Dad, you're the worst dad in the history of the world, Dad. All you ever do, Dad, is say no. We hate you, Dad. You're the worst dad ever. You just say no all the time. We hate you so much, Dad. We're going to go to Notre Dame. And I would look at him and I'd say, hey, I would love to say yes. Everybody wants to live in the culture of yes, but the culture of yes is built on the foundation of no. So 
to my children, I would say, if you want me to say yes, you've got to start asking me better questions. Hey, Dad, can I go to work for Green Builder Media? Dad, can I turn off the television set? Can I improve my diet, Dad? Can I read a new book today, Dad? Can I do the dishes for you? Can I wash the car? Can I cut the grass? Can I do the laundry? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so what was your question, Ron? I actually have a question for you. Okay, Ron. good. And, and it's, it's a... It's By the way, your magazine is incredible. Best magazine. Oh, I've ever I was going to ask you how you like our magazine. I tell you, no, I, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> and I love from the tailgate because uh, you speak from the heart and you talk uh, about what you know and you've been there. Thank you. I can't believe it's taken me 66 years to find you, man. Well, we were there the whole time. You weren't out there on the Grateful Dead tour? No, no. You no, kind of uh, looked like you. No, were. I, I, mean, I, I, have, I know you're up there by I'm Colorado. Just grateful, I'm Lake just Street. grateful to be alive. Um, Bill, I have a serious question for you, though. It's all serious. Yeah. Look. I, I know that you are a student of history, that you're very involved in history. in history and geography, and you've traveled the world, and, and the amazing repertoire of, of stories and the people that you've known and talked with, but I have a question for you. Anyone from history or present that, that you have never spoken with that you would like to have a conversation with? I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I had the greatest childhood. You know, I read the stories of the people who just had these awful childhoods, and that's the antithesis of me. My parents were the greatest people ever. Zero interest in sports, but the greatest parents ever. I never shot a basket with my dad. I saw him run one time at the church picnic and fell over laughing. My mom was our town's librarian. I was super lucky. I came across this incredible coach when I was eight years old. I grew up in Southern California, and this guy, he was the local fireman. And what do firemen do? When they see trouble, they head straight for it with the mantra, I'll take care of this. And that coach was the guy that taught me the love of, of sports, of life, of team. And he was a volunteer. He was, a vo he was the fireman, he was a volunteer coach at our elementary school. The fire station was here, our school was here, my mom's library was right there. And so he saw the need, the same way that this group, the Green Builder Media, sees the need for what we have to do to get to where we want to go to sustain and keep it all going. So Rocky was his name, and he saw all these children spilling out the, the doors of the school at 3 o'clock with the closing bell, and, he, and there was nothing to do. This was in 1956 when he became the volunteer coach at our school for every grade, every level, every student, every sport, all year round. I joined up with Rocky when I was eight years old in 1960, and he'd already been at it for four years. He was the volunteer at that same school for 59 years, every day, never took a penny. When he died a few years ago, the richest guy I've ever known. I cannot tell you today if he knew anything about sports, but he knew team, and he knew joy, and he knew hope, and he knew happiness, and we couldn't wait to get there to be with Rocky, who was going to take us someplace super fun in a joyous, celebratory atmosphere. My brother and I were the most unathletic parents you've ever seen. Zero interest in sports, although my mom today, she's 92, she still lives in the same house we all grew up in, she's been there for 66 years, she never misses a Laker game. <laughs> and so, but my older brother and I are the only brother combination in the history of the world to have played in the Super Bowl and to have won the NBA championship. And so when Bruce and I presented our Super Bowl and NBA championship rings to our parents, they looked at these big gaudy jewelry deals and they looked at them and said, what is this? And they threw them aside and we never saw them again. So we had our parents, we had Rocky, and then when I was 9 or 10, 1962, I found Chick Hearn on the radio, the greatest broadcaster ever, and he just opened up a whole new world. And then on top of this whole thing, this whole culture, an atmosphere that I grew up in, every teacher and coach that I had as a child was a John Wooden disciple. But I also was most fortunate in that I had the freedom, the chimes of freedom, 
to be able to pick my own heroes and role models. And so at a very early age, I picked Bill Russell and Muhammad Ali. I picked Sergeant Shriver, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy. And then I picked all the musicians that I've been talking about. Jerry Garcia, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, John Fogarty, Jimmy Cliff, Jackson Brown, the Beach Boys, Fleetwood Mac, Crosby, Stills and Nash, the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, it's an endless list, Carlos Santana, they're all out there still playing, a lot of them over here on the Las Vegas trip all the time and it's just absolutely awesome. Today, those guys are still my heroes. I haven't changed them, I add heroes all the time. The ones I wanted to meet, who I didn't get the chance to, have all been gunned down. April 1968, Martin Luther King. June 1968, Bobby Kennedy. 1980, John Lennon. Gunned down. And other than that, I met all the guys I wanted to meet. And uh, it, it's, been, it's been fantastic. I've been the luckiest guy in the world. What was your question again? What was, what was your name again? My name is Bill <laughs> from San Diego. Yeah, Bill. But, uh, let me let me let me shift gears a little bit and ask you this. And and by, and by the way, Bill and I had the privilege of, of having a nice phone conversation about a month ago, and and just when you're my age, you remember what happened, you imagine, and you remember <laughs> what was who was there, but you can't remember when it was. I well, mean, was it, was, it a month it was ago. A, was it ten years yeah, ago? Yeah, it was know. a while back. But um, th the point is that uh, we didn't set up any questions here. We just said we were going to have a conversation. I said, I said, Bill, I tell you what, let's do. Let's pretend that we're uh, looking at each other over a campfire, and I'll ask you real questions, and you give me real answers. And I'm Bill's, trying. Bill I'm trying said that best. would work, so I hope that it's working for you, too. Um, let, let me shift just a little bit and ask you this, because I think it's really important. In our culture today, so much adulation and, and um, worship takes place with uh, professional athletes and other celebrities sure. and so forth, and I know that there are a lot of efforts underway at both at the collegiate level and the pro level, uh, particularly in your uh, sport of specialty uh, yeah. basketball, mm -hmm. to engage the sustainability movement right. and to make a difference. Can you it, tell it, us some it, about that? It, it's fantastic. And the world of sport that we have today, across all sport, is the result of the efforts of six different people and forces from 35 years ago, when it all came together. And in no particular order, You've got David Stern, who's the most important man in the history of basketball, this tall and never made a basket, never shot a basket, but the most important person in the history of basketball. He was able to make a game into a business, and what a business it is right now. And then you had Phil Knight. Phil Knight, the most important person in the history of all sport, because he has taken you know, gear, stuff, apparel, and made it into this, the greatest sporting company ever. And Phil's success at the Nike level, and that's the shoe dog story, and Nike's annual revenues are more than the annual revenues of all the major sports combined. Football, basketball, baseball, hockey, whatever else you want to name, you combine all the sports, Nike has more combined revenue than all those sports together. So that's the first two in a, in, in a non-important order. Then you have Michael Jordan, the personification of excellence in everything on and off the court with the exception of his Charlotte, whatever they're called right now. But he promises me that he's working on that. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> and then Michael's agent, Michael's agent, David Falk, who was able to bring the money down. And I'm for anything that improves the, the lives and the quality of everything of people down the ladder. The people at the top, they're always going to be fine. And what we need to worry about is the rest of the team and how their dreams are going to come true. And that's what David Falk has been able to do as the leader in that whole initiative. And then you got Jerry Buss. You're the leader of this. Jerry Buss, the Laker owner, greatest owner in the history of all professional team sports. He made it fun. He created the atmosphere, paid the players more than he had to because he wanted to. And he just, he, he became their friends in a relationship that is really not built for friendship. And then finally, you have the innovation and the development and the evolution of ESPN, the messenger. And what you have in your world with Green Builder Media 
That's what the world of sport has with ESPN. Somebody just to constantly deliver that message and what the message is going to be. And fortunately for all those people involved, they care about other people and they care about sustainability and they care about the earth and they're willing to use their platform. But David Stern was willing to get out there. And David tells this fantastic story of when he was first expanding the NBA, Basketball Without Borders, to Africa. And he goes to Africa and he meets with Nelson Mandela. And David, you know, as confident a guy as you'll ever come across. But there he is in the presence of Nelson Mandela, who'd spent 27 years in a cage on an island because of what he thought and in his efforts to try to make other people's lives and dreams better and come true. And so David asked Nelson for advice and guidance. And Nelson looked right back at David and said, keep doing what you're doing. You have this incredible vehicle and you're spreading a positive message of hope and optimism and dreams coming true. Because I've learned in the course of my life what is what are the elements of being happy? Number one is health. And, and, and that is incredibly enhanced by participation in sports. And then number two is having your team, your family around you. Number three is what you guys do is build the homes, the sanctuary, the safe haven where we can go and rejuvenate and recuperate. And then at the end of that, after all those are in place, you, you have to have the hope and the dream that tomorrow is going to be better and that tomorrow's worth fighting for. I mean, you get up this morning, you see the snow on the mountains and you see the beautiful red rocks all around. You see the incredible construction going on. And, you know, and, and, and we have that chance. Wesley Clark this morning talked about that great golden opportunity that's right there. All I ever wanted in life was more. All I ever wanted in life was a chance. I'm always sick. I'm always sick of something or somebody. But I know what my medicine is. It's taken me a long time to find it out. But my medicine is participation in athletic movement and just being able to move. I mean, I spent four and a half years, I spent, spent half my life, half my adult life in the hospital. I spent all my adult life in chronic pain. I never thought I'd be free of pain. I never thought I'd be happy in love. But today, I'm both. I'm madly in love with my wife of 30 years. I can't speak for her, that's her choice. And, and I just, I, I cannot believe how fantastic physically I feel and how that enables me to have a spirit. And so I know that my medicine is participation in movement activities. I'm able to do three things. I can go to the pool, I can go to the weight room, and I can ride my bicycle. And I'm terrible at all three of them, but I can do them. And I still have all my limbs. And then the next thing, is you got to do it in a group dynamic. You got to do it in a, in a team setting with other guys who are sharing the same dreams and same goals and aspirations. I just finished today, you know, this, in between Wesley Clark and coming here today, I just finished The Boys in the Boat by Daniel James Brown, a remarkable story of overcoming adversity and team and coaching and leadership. Just brilliant, The Boys in the Boat. Please check that out. And then the music. The music which creates wherever you are that atmosphere, the belief that, yeah, we can get this done. So let me just throw out some general lyrics to put that in place, and we'll get right back to you. Ron, correct? When you get confused, listen to the music play. We used to play for silver, now we play for life. Once in a while, you get shown the light in the strangest of places if you look at it right. I used to be a lost sailor, away too long at sea. Now I'm a tiger in a trance, a saint of circumstance. I sure don't know what I'm going for, but I'm going to go for it for sure. There's no time to lose. The first days are the hardest days. Don't worry about it. But when life looks like easy street, there's danger at your door. What I want to know is, are you kind and will you come with me? It all rolls into one, but nothing comes for free. And when I was sitting there thinking about Ron's question, the guys who I wanted to meet, wow, Martin Luther King, 
I just received the MLK Legacy Award back in Memphis. I stood on the balcony April 4th. I remember Bobby Kennedy. I knew his whole family, all his children. I know his wife. The incredible job that they have done over the course of their lives, keeping the dream moving forward. And we always have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Are we doing everything? Is our concept of everything enough? And so I, I was so lucky. You know, Bill Russell just celebrated his 85th birthday. Muhammad Ali. To go to UCLA from 1970 to 1974 and to just be right in the middle of all the action and all the fights and all the celebration and all the joy and to see how far it's come and how much better. To be in California when in the 50s the air was so clean, the water was so pure, and then all of a sudden with the mass influx of people, it all turned brown, air and water. And then people would say, we're not going to accept this. This is just not, not going to be our future. And so through rules and regulations, now those brown days are gone and the water is cleaner. Can we do better? Yes, we can always do better. But the, the willingness to step to the front and to use the technology, to use the brain power, and, and, and to have that political will that the general was talking about today. And another great book about political will and individual will. Read The Immortal Irishman by Timothy Egan. It's just a, an incredible, spectacular human being who never stopped fighting until the very, very end. And that's what I want to do with my life. Please, God, don't let me die. There's so much more to do. Now, what was your question again? <laughs> I have another question for you. <clears throat> and I want to set this one up a little bit. You may have with noticed... what? I didn't hear you may have noticed in the uh, in the program today, Sarah had asked me to to put some thoughts together, and there's a, a little note in there that this, it's this it's, right here. It's for all of you. This right here. <laughs> and uh, if you haven't read this, if you don't read regularly, Sarah, what an angel of mercy! <laughs> You're standing in the shaft of light. I tell you, just the Grateful Dead wrote songs about her, and it was just it was fantastic. And she sent me this big package all the back issues of Green Builder Media and the program and then the, what about the flex houses and stuff? <laughs> I have wasted so much time, oh my gosh. Well, she asked me to see if I could come up with something that was meaningful in my own words about what we were doing here today. And uh, the, the page uh, has a little, um, little thought piece that I put together, but it's about courage. Right. And I use the example of Probably the most poignant moment of courage that I ever saw in my life, and it involved a thin, young Asian man in a white shirt yep. standing in front of a column of tanks in Tiananmen Square. Yeah. You were there? No. You saw it on TV. But I wish I had been there. Right. Uh, right. Because, Bill, I think that... All those people got killed. Well, but you know what? I, th I think we should all experience a moment of that kind of courage. And I want to ask you about courage, because... Change takes courage, and if we're going right. to do this, and I know you've experienced courage on a number of levels in your life to overcome the obstacles that you have and to rise to the to the level of a legend. And and you know we called this we called this uh, session uh, legend and legacy, and that's where I'm going with this. I want you to tell me your thoughts around what courage it takes to make change and what you would like your legacy to be. I'm too young to think about legacy. I grew up in a culture of people who just worked every day until they died. And that's what I hope I'm able to do. That was John Wooden, my parents, Rocky, Chick Hearn, Jack Ramsey. You know, I had the incredible privilege and honor of playing basketball, which doesn't require courage. That's a game. The stakes, are, the stakes are minimal. When you're playing, you think it's life or death. But when you're not playing, when you, when you can't play anymore, I haven't been able to play basketball in 33 years. I haven't been able to walk for fun or pleasure or excitement or joy. I haven't been able to backpack for, for 40 years. So 
So, but when you're playing, you, you know, you're so caught up in, in all of that, that, you know, you think it's super important. But you quickly realize when you're not able to play anymore that it was just a game. And, and, and the stakes are nothing like what, what Wesley Clark was fighting and nothing like what we're all fighting today, the, the fight to stay alive. And uh, another incredible book is The Sympathizer by Viet Van Wen, he pronounces it, but you spell it N-G-U-Y-E-N, and I don't know how you get that pronunciation out of that spelling, but that's, you're allowed to call yourself whatever you want. We lived through that with Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and that's all fine and good. But the courage to stand in front of a tank the courage to, to be Colonel Marr in the immortal Irishman, lying at the bottom of a hill in the pouring rain and sleet and snow, knowing that your entire battalion is going to get killed. The, the long gray line, that is courage. M most of the moments in my life uh, of when I needed to show courage, I failed. And no one has failed more than I have. No one has made more mistakes. I'm guilty of everything. Mostly what I'm guilty of is smiling on a cloudy day. But the mistakes I've made are ongoing, where I stand in the, but they were never willful mistakes. And uh, I just chose the wrong path, and it turned out to be the wrong path. And, but the things that you wish you had done, in terms of the standing up to, to do the right thing that, you, that you're afraid of, that you think that, okay, this is going to work out if I just hang in there a little bit longer. And it was, uh, they, they weigh on you heavily. The, and when you, when you let people down, when you, when you fail the team, and it's, uh, it's tough. And, you, and, and then all the things from the song, all the things I tried to do, but only did halfway. And I, I was super lucky in that people have always been nicer to me than I deserve. And people have shown me great patience, great sacrifice, great discipline in their lives so that I could continue to have more chances. And so my levels of, cur of courage are inconsequential. But the courage of my spine doctor, the courage of all the guys who, the, all the first responders who are out there every single day. We, we live in downtown San Diego, the eighth largest city in the country. We live right in between four hospitals, and it's a war zone, I mean, every night. You know, the fact that we tolerate 40,000 gun deaths in our country every year is just unacceptable. And, you know, if I had courage, I would have made the NRA's enemies list. I would have made Nixon's enemies list. I tried but apparently I didn't try hard enough. And so as we, as we think about this current fight that we have and all the challenges of understanding the, the forces of evil that are trying to, for their own economic self-interest, to keep us from our dreams. And those are the fights that I'm involved in today. And I can give you some examples, I mean, I. I remember, you know, w w one of the failures that I had was that we took too long uh, to, you know, General Clark addressed this this morning. That, you know, there's currently in America there are not people in the streets, which is kind of shocking to me, because in my youth there, there there were people in the streets, and uh, so and I was one of them, and so one day I was arrested at a peace rally, and. Coach Wooden had to come and bail me out of jail. And he was driving me home from the jailhouse back to school. And he is in my face. And he is, Walton, this is just not acceptable. You're letting me down. You're letting UCLA down. You're letting the NCAA down. You're letting your parents down, your family, and everybody else that I've ever known, you're letting down. And I looked at him and I said, Coach, this is just unacceptable. You know, this war in Vietnam is just ridiculous. It's just, the whole thing is a big scam, and we're just not gonna, we're not gonna let this happen. He, starts, he still keeps coming back at me, and I finally stop him, and I say, Coach, you can say and think what you want, 
but it's my friends and it's my buddies and it's my classmates who are coming back in wheelchairs with amputees and are coming back in body bags. And I'm just not going to sit here and say, this is all fine. We're just going to let this play out. And so he looked at me and he said, you know, Bill, I don't approve of this war either, but I think you're going about it wrong. And I think what you should do, Bill, is write letters. Write letters? What are you talking about, coach? Silly old man. And so he drops me off in front of the dorm. He drives home to his family. Imagine what his wife Nell said to him that night. And so instead of going right into my dorm, I, make, I just had this lightning bolt flash of inspiration that sears across the smoking crater that's my mind, and I get this fantastic idea about the letters. So I make a quick U-turn, and I go down the hill across pa past Polly Pavilion and into Coach Wooden's office where his secretary, Al Dean, was still there. Nobody was there that night. It was late in the afternoon. And so I said, hey, Al Dean, do you have any UCLA basketball stationery? And she said, yes, Bill, is everything all right? I said, yes, yes, Coach Wooden wants me to write a letter. And so she handed me this perfect piece of paper, right? It's got, it's got his picture on the top of it and all the championship basketballs <laughs> across the top. And I go back to the dorm and I sit in front of my typewriter and I script this letter to Nixon. And I outline all his crimes against humanity and I demand the immediate withdrawal of all our troops from Southeast Asia that end this war right now. And then I said, and we also want you to resign, Nixon. And I thanked him in advance for his cooperation. <laughs> so I come to practice the next day. And all the guys who were on the team, they were there at the peace rally too. I was the one that went down with the cops. And so I go in the locker room. They said, Bill, what did Coach Wooden say? I said, well, they told me to write a letter. And I did. They said, let's see the letter, Bill. And they see this. Like, oh, this is great, Bill. They signed it too. Jamal Wilkes, Greg Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton. All these guys <laughs> signed the letter, right? And then I take the letter into the next room where Coach was getting ready for practice. He said, oh, Bill, it was an excellent discussion we had yesterday. And, and I said, I, I know, Coach, and I took it to heart. So I went home and I wrote a letter. He said, oh, great, Bill, let me see this. And so I hand him the piece of paper with his picture on the top of it. And he's reading this letter, and he just wants to crumple it up. You know, you can just see his fingers going white, and there's no blood in his fingers. He wants to just tear the whole thing up. But he hands it back to me in perfect condition and looks up at me with the sad, soft eyes of a father who's just been let down. And he looked up at me and he says, Bill, I can't sign this letter. And you're not going to send it in, are you, Bill? I said, Coach, I always do everything you tell me to do. And so I took it back from him and I mailed it to Nixon. And sure enough, the guy resigned. It was fantastic. <laughs> now, I've been writing these letters forever, never with success like that. Now let's flash, fo flash forward 20 years. I love flashbacks, but we like, flash forwards are good too. And so. This was in 1994, and Coach Wooden and I were going together into the Academic All-America Hall of Fame. And it's in Washington, D.C., the city of hope, where it's just so inspirational when you're there. And it's just phenomenal, all the different stuff. And so there's going to be an evening event for the program. Now, I'm an early riser. My mom has said for 66 years, if Billy would only sleep past 6 a.m. in the morning, our lives would all be so much better. So I'm up early, and I know Coach Wooden is an early riser, too. So I call him in his room, and I say, let's go out and do something. He says, sure. So I get a car. We're in the car. We're driving away from the hotel. I said, where do you want to go, Coach? I said, I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. And I said, Coach, it does matter to me. How about we go to the Lincoln Memorial? because I know that you and Abe Lincoln grew up together in the Midwest there. And it'd be <laughs> nice for you to say hello to your boyhood friend. And he rolled his eyes. And so he said, okay, let's go. So we go to the Lincoln Memorial. It's early in the morning. It's fantastic. The morning dew is lifting, and the droplets are just evaporating. And we're climbing the steps, and these two old guys. And, and I don't know who's helping who. We get to the top, and people are all coming around him. And, and they all want his autograph, and they all, you know, th this was before cell phones, so there was no picture taking in those days. And so they all wanted to meet him, and, he, and Coach Wooden said, this is a sacred place. This is not a place for autographs, not a place for talk. So let's just all take a moment and just think and reflect. And so he turned his back, 
to one of the wa to the walls with the Gettysburg Address on it, and he recited the Gettysburg Address from memory, out loud, to this growing circle of people around him. And it was just incredibly powerful and spectacular. And then at the end, everybody burst into applause, and he said, no, no, this is a sacred place. And now we're coming down, and the sun is coming up behind the Washington Monument, and the reflecting pond is out there, the Capitol in the background, and it's just absolutely spectacular what can be. And as we're coming down, and the car's on our right, we get there, and he takes the step to his right, and I stop him. I said, Coach, would you come over here with me to the Vietnam D and the memorial over there? And he looked up at me, and I had a tear in my eye. And he said, okay, let's go. And so we turned and we walked back. We went through the Korean memorial, and then we went down into the V and the saddest place. And everybody there on crutches, in wheelchairs, there's flowers, there's wreaths. And it's just that, and everybody's just crying and holding onto the wall and everything. And as the crowd gathers around Coach Wooden, again, he holds them back. And he says, and he starts repeating from memory Grant Lynn's Rice poem, Two Sides of War. Now, I have no memory, so I can't repeat it. But the final line is that he talks about the insanity of war. And, and then he says, but the biggest crime is that all the dead are hardly more than boys. And everybody is just screaming down crying, and we walked up the other side, and then we went on. And his, ability to, his ability to teach us life's greatest lessons, one of the life's greatest lessons is to take the worst things that happen to you in your life and somehow find a way to make those into the best. Now, the worst thing that's happened to me, you ask about courage. The worst thing that's happened to me has been my spine. And I, that my, when I was on the ground, it was, well, I was going to kill myself because it just wasn't worth continuing. There was just so much pain and there was no hope whatsoever. But I'm lucky as can be. Lucky as can be to have not only Ron in my life, but John Wooden for 43 years. Three years as a high school player, he was recruiting me. Four years as his player at, uh, at for UCLA. And then by far the best years of uh, our 43 years together were the 36 years when we were friends. Because he was not your friend when you were playing for him. He had a job to do, and he drove you. And, he, you know, he had I, – I was Coach Wooden's easiest recruit. I became his worst nightmare, and I drove the poor guy to an early grave. Uh, at 99. I always wanted to know why. Why I had to cut my hair, why I had to shave, why I had to wear the clothes he wanted me to wear, why Nixon was president, why we were in Vietnam, and why the cheerleaders couldn't be in my hotel room on the road trips, right? <laughs> and so he would sit there and he would listen. And maybe there's a sl the slideshow working. Maybe there's a picture of Coach Wooden like this. That, this was his look. He was an English teacher by profession who happened to have young men under his athletic supervision in the afternoon. But he would rest his chin on his thumb, put his finger across his lips, and he would listen. And then finally he'd have enough, and he'd roll his eyes, wave his hands, and said, you know, Bill, it's all fine and good that you think this way, but I'm the coach here. And while we've enjoyed having you, we're going to miss you. And as soon as he said that, I knew I had lost. In 43 years, I never won a single argument with the guy, right? But he was this incredibly remarkable human being who was a teacher, who was a leader, who was willing to stand up. Super positive, super optimistic. He was uh, uh, kind, gentle, warm-hearted, loving. He made it fun. Even though he was demanding and tough and exacting, we couldn't wait to get there every day. And so over the course of the life that we had together, I, I never encountered anyone who didn't have my best interest at heart until I was 21 years old. And then I joined the NBA. And as soon as I joined the NBA, I realized what an incredible mistake I had made by just, just driving this guy crazy. So I spent the rest of my life with him trying to quit causing the poor guy grief and consternation. 
And so ultimately, we did a thousand shows like this together. And every kind of show imaginable. And this one night we were doing a show and there was a big, huge crowd and tons of media in the front row. And we went to the Q&A part and, and everybody was asking questions. We're having a great and old time. And then this one young person in the very front row, kind of like this guy right here, he's just sitting there sheepishly trying to get in all, all night long. The guy can't get coach's attention. who's moderating the, you know, the Q&A part. And so finally, coach says, okay, young man, what do you got? And the guy sheepishly leans in. If you look at him, you could just tell. There was no way. He was too young to have known what it was like to, to go through this whole period of time. And so this guy said, Coach Wooden, Coach Wooden, were you really going to kick Bill Walton off the team because he wasn't going to cut his hair or shave or wear the clothes you wanted him to wear? And Coach Wooden, sitting in his chair like Ron is over there, sits up a little extra straight and looks at the guy, looks at the crowd, looks over at me, and then leans right back to the guy and says, the only thing that matters is that Bill thought I was going to kick him off the team. <laughs> and I did. And there was nothing more important than being on the team. Because Coach Wooden, he gave, us, he gave us the foundational platform as to how you become great. And that was based on his pyramid of success. Now, he wasn't didactic in terms of you have to do this, but if you wanted to be on his team, you better do it. And so he had his pyramid of success, which were 15 human values and personal characteristics that he thought were important in becoming the champion. Now, granted, champions distinguished themselves by their mental acuity, their decision-making capability, and then their emotional commitment. But you don't just get to that point. You've got to build the foundation. And that foundation for him was built on the terms, the qualities, the human attributes, industriousness and enthusiasm. Do you love what you're doing and you're willing to work at it? The elements of the team, friendship, loyalty, cooperation. The second tier, which is the hardest tier by far, intentness, initiative, alertness, self-control. The middle tier, preparation, physical fitness, skill development, commitment to the team, and then the performance blocks at the very top, poise, confidence, and competitive greatness. Years later, he thought of two other traits that he thought were important, so he just added them. He added them in the clouds because there was no more room in the pyramid, and Galileo <laughs> wasn't around to be able to reshape the pyramid. Faith and patience. Do you believe, and are you willing to put the lifetime in that it takes? Coach wouldn't live by the seven-point creed that his father gave him when he was in high school. Make each day your masterpiece. Drink deeply from all sources of knowledge. Make friendship a fine art. Prepare for the tough times that are sure to come. And then three others that I can't remember, but I have no memory. And then Coach Wooden lived by his two sets of threes, which he thought were important, and he implored us to give it a try. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Don't whine, don't complain, don't make excuses. That covers a lot of ground. And then he had his endless maxims. And it's super easy to memorize all this stuff, but try to implement it when you're on the ground, when the ball goes the other way, when the deals are someplace else and you can't get it done. It's nearly impossible. Be quick, but don't hurry. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Happiness begins when selfishness ends. Never mistake activity for achievement. The worst things you could do for the ones you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. Things work out best for those that make the best out of the way things work out. When everybody thinks alike, nobody thinks. It's okay to disagree, just don't be disagreeable. And then the one that he wrote for me on the day I graduated, June 1974, to Bill Walton. It's the things you learn after you know it all that count. John Wooden sits on my desk to this very day. And then his go-to mantra, when things were tough, and he didn't know what to say. Basketball, like life, is not a game of size and strength. It's a game of skill, timing, and position. It's not how big you are, it's how big you play. It's not how high you jump, it's where you are and when you jump. So I'm scratching my head, I'm scratching my head my whole life with this guy, that's why I was bald today. And so I'm asking them, Coach, this makes no sense whatsoever. You're telling us that basketball, like life, is not a game of size and strength? Come on. You're kidding me, right? Kareem has all the records. Shaq has all the money. And Wilt has 20,000 girlfriends. And you're telling us that it's not about size and strength? Come on. And he looked at me and said, Walton, you're the slowest learner I've ever had. <laughs> Don't you realize it's not about stuff? 
not about material accumulation and physical gratification. It's about training the mind, the commitment of the heart and soul to become the champion in everything that you do. But that requires subjugating the ego. The ego, which is a good thing, but it's got to be balanced with humility. The humility that finds that teeter-totter balance of life, economics, and the environment so that dreams do come true. And then I know you're getting tired of me talking up here, so just hold on one second. I'm almost <laughs> done on this one. And so, but Coach Wooden would race through all of that stuff. That was the positive aspects because he knew that it was about what happens when things go wrong. And that's when you had to have the tool chest. You guys are builders. You all have your tools. His tools were the psychological aspects. Gary, the patriarch of this whole deal here, Dr. Gary back there in, C in Castle Rocks, Colorado with his wife, Sheila, where it all started back there. And those tools that come with the ability to overcome the failures and the challenges and the disasters in your life. And that's where he would always get to as quickly as he possibly could, the motivation. What's going to drive you? Motivation ultimately has to come from within. When you're young and getting started, it comes from everywhere. And you're just grasping. But when you're the champion, you know that it comes from deep inside you. Then the ultimate skills that everybody has to develop and acquire. Balance, quickness, creative imagination, and empathy. Ultimately leading to the confidence. The confidence of the champion knowing you're going to win. You're going to get the job done. The confidence which I had to develop on March 15, 1990. 20 Nine years ago, 29 years ago, I'm lying in a hospital bed in Whittier, California, the birthplace of Richard Nixon, the Prince of Darkness. And I have made a <laughs> voluntary choice to go to this hospital there to have my ankle fused, my 30th operation. The first 29 were a piece of cake. They were all about getting me back in the game. Basketball, the most perfect game of all, yeah. All you have to do is wait for the opening tip, and then who can play, who's in shape, who's got a game. There's no waiting around. Who really wants this? Unlike football, which is basically a halfway house between the Army and prison, or <laughs> baseball, which is a bunch of out-of-shape guys standing around, scratching themselves, taking steroids, waiting for the game of life to come to them. No, but basketball, yeah, I love yelling at the refs. Come on, make a call where you go back to Foot Locker where you belong, where I'm yelling at the coach. Come on, Wooden, give me some players out here, and I'm tired of doing this all by myself. But now it's over. They're going to take a big electric saw and cut all the ends of the bones off in my foot and ankle. They're going to take all this big, massive bleeding ball of bone, push it all together. One guy holds it at a right angle. Another guy puts two big plates on either side of it. Another one takes one of your power drills from you builder guys, right? And he bolts the, the whole thing together just so I could come on February 18th to the Armidus Ham Arena Hall here and speak at the Green Builders Media Sustainability Symposium. And I'm lying there, and my life is over. And it's helplessly spiraling out of control. And I have nothing, nothing left. The game was my religion. The gym was my church. And it dawns on me right then, hey, man, this lightning bolt flashes across the smoking crater that's my mind. And I just realized that I'm 6'11". I got red hair. I got a big nose. I got a goofy, nerdy-looking face. I got freckles all over my body. I can't speak at all. I'm a deadhead, having been to more than 1,000 Grateful Dead concerts in the last 52 years. Television is the only career possibility for me to pursue. <laughs> They looked at me and they said, no way, Walton, get out of here. You're going to start stuttering and spitting all over everybody, and I apologize to the guys in the front row. You start talking about Jerry Garcia and Bob Dylan and Neil Young and John Fogarty and Jimmy Cliff and Jackson Brown and the Rolling Stones. We can't have that, Walton, so just get out of here. I couldn't get a job. I had nothing. But that's when I implemented Coach Wooden's final tools, the perseverance, the persistence, and the discipline to get what you want. As we're going to chase this dream and the sustainability drive, which we have to win, we have no other choice. And so I kept taking a step back because when you're up against it, it's not about minor adjustments on the perimeter. It's about your core, your foundation, who you are, what you want, how you're going to get to where you want to be. And so I'm standing back, taking step back, step back all the time. And I'm on the precipice. I'm on the ledge. Listen to Jerry Garcia and Merle 
Saunders singing September 1st, 1974, Bob Dylan's Going, Going, Gone. And I'm on that ledge, and there's no place left to step back one more time. And I finally get my first job as the broadcaster. It made no difference to me, but it did to Lori and the children that it was on Christmas Day from Bakersfield, California, a CBA game on the radio for no pay, and the team and the entire league were folding the next day, but yeah, I was broadcasting, and I'm on my way. Let's go. And then, like everybody else, I got a break. I got a break to call a huge game with Dick Enberg, just like I got the break to come here and speak to Green Builder Media with Ron. And Dick, like Ron, just the greatest of the greats. And we got this big game, and I have no idea what I'm doing. And I am terrified, and I'm questioning my own decision to even be there. And the producer starts his clock countdown, 10, 9. And I'm sweating profusely, and I'm chewing my gum, and I'm going over everything in my mind. <coughs> what am I going to do? I'm memorizing my ad libs, and I'm writing everything down. And look over at Dick and the producer, 7, 6. Dick's having the time of his life. He's waving to all the pretty ladies in the crowd. He's signing autographs for the children. He's having a drink of who knows what. He knows that producer's 540. That red light's going to come on in a few more minutes. He's just going to start talking about basketball and life for the next two hours. And he looks over at me. He says, Walton, you look terrible. What's wrong with you? I said, Dick, I don't belong here. I shouldn't even be out here. This is terrible. I'm going to start stuttering and spitting all over everything. Why am I doing this? And he looked at me. And Billy taps me on the leg. The producer says, three, two, and he says, that red light's going to come on in one more second, Billy, and there's going to be 35 million people hanging on every word you <laughs> say. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dick. I chased that dream for 18 years before February 24th, 2008, and my spine failed. The week before, I had just been named one of the top 10 pundits in all of media. I had just been named one of the top 20 sports business representatives around the entire planet. I had just been named one of the top 50 sportscasters of all time. If I can do this, what's to keep you from getting to the top of the mountain, from making your dreams come true? And so I ask you two questions, because I know what this means. This means he <laughs> wants me to stop. We only got time for one, Bill. No. <laughs> I ask you two questions. <laughs> if I can do this, what's to keep you from doing what you do best, what your dream is? And when you want to quit, when you just say this is too hard, this is not worth it, I ask you, as General Clark asked us today in his call for action, I ask you, how many billions, and I'm talking about billions with a B, how many billions of people in the world would do anything to be you? And when you're sitting there and you're saying it's going to be easier to quit, just ask yourself, is that really a viable option? I've looked at all the other options. They're not worth it. I'm going forward. I'm going for it. And so as I thank you, as I get to the end of my introductory remarks, <laughs> I will be up there wherever we're going to be. Ron's in charge. Ron and Sarah, ultimately, Sheila and Gary are in charge. But all these great people at Green Builder Media who have given us this great, incredible chance, this great opportunity for a path forward. I thank you for your kindness, for your generosity, for your vision for your discipline, for your sacrifice, for your honor. I was there last night. For the rest of my life, I'll be able to say that I was there as a child <laughs> when I saw all these incredible businessmen making the future possible. But what I really thank you for is your patience and for my life. My life in the beginning was a life of hope, opportunity, and purpose. Over time, it's changed. Yes, those are still part of it, but now it's a life of pride, the satisfaction with my choices, loyalty, do I care, does any of this really matter? Yes, it does. And then the gratitude, the appreciation of the people who have given me this greatest life ever. The end of the book, the sympathizer, we are alive. We have a chance. Please, God, don't let me die. There's so much more to do. 
may the four winds blow you safely home. Thank you so much, folks. Appreciate it. Awesome job. Awesome job. The only thing standing between you and some adult refreshment is me, and I'm not going to say another word. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Where are we going now? <laughs> up top. Up to, the, up to the foyer, and I'll be there. I'll be the last guy to leave. Thank you, Bill. <laughs>